I, I, w I wasn't able to like just form a presentation, so I'm going to be looking at the book, read the chapter, just spend those last two weeks have been yeah. at work, tiring. <laughs> um, but did read, and uh, I, think, I think it was actually a pretty solid chapter. Um, it was. I agree with you there. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Hey, okay, Ron. full house today. Good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, here, I'm going to share my screen. And Ryan is now Ryan instead of RH, so we don't <laughs> get so easily confused. I didn't real, yeah, I never noticed that <laughs> until uh, last time. Uh, do you guys see my screen? And more mm -hmm. importantly, uh, does it look readable? Yeah. Yes. Great. Awesome. You could make it a bit bigger, maybe. I think on the YouTube, it's going to be. That good? Or even bigger? Yeah, well, we'll see how that goes. I think that's good for me, but. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I just didn't have the unfortunate time to make a presentation, but um, yeah, again, just work has been a lot, but um, did read the chapter. That was, you know, I was saying this, uh, Ryan, before you got here. I thought it was a pretty good, good chapter. I know also you uh, were talking about that you had some experience with uh, like over dispersion and, you know, negative binomial regression, so. You know, I guess when we get to that part, you know, feel free to, you know, <laughs> it, it, add any insights. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I guess like the over dispersion fit like kind of makes sense to me, but I don't know. I don't really have like a good intuitive way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's it's, and I will just say as as a back having a background in like social sciences, we're 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 kind of like not always geared towards thinking about like count type models like Bayesian and mm -hmm. or excuse me like um. Like negative binomial Poisson, it's like we we typically only kind of think about things as like normal distributions. And so, yeah. um, real quick, actually, I don't know if anyone else picked up on this when they defined like this idea of counts. It's like it's how many times something occurs over a defined period of time, right? And so that's one thing that's really important for it to be a proper count model is like whatever you're measuring has to be measured over a sort of consistent period of time for all. Things which I, I only say that because I've had things where like in the hindsight, I'm like, you know, I, I started thinking about doing a count kind of a Poisson model and it, it was, um, yeah, it was wrong. So some, just something to point out. No, I think that that's good. Um, Cause yeah, I guess like there's like implicitly some temporal structure, right? That's mm -hmm. like not really, you know, stated, but obviously, yeah, you kind of need that um, mm -hmm. for it to actually, you know, fit a Poisson. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Um, so yeah, you know, obviously the chapter is about Poisson and negative binomial regression. The last two chapters, right, we've been talking about, uh, you know, we've been really focusing just on regression. Uh, we've obviously start with simple linear regression, just with one predictor. Uh, last chapter, we were talking about uh, multiple linear regression, right, which is multiple predictors. And we were uh, mostly focused on assuming that our uh, Y variable, the you know, target of interest uh, is normally distributed. Um, now we're obviously getting an example in which that is not the case. Um, so, you know, the, the example, the first example uh, is talking about um, the level of anti, you know, the number of anti-discrimination laws um, across the U.S. in each individual state. Um, so we're, you know, kind of interested in, in seeing whether or not um, a, a state's urban, like, let me rephrase that. We're interested in seeing if like a state's uh, urban percentage, so how many people live in like an urban area um, and the state's historical voting patterns, whether or not it was, you know, votes historically for like a Republican candidate or a Democratic candidate or is a swing state where they kind of, you know, change depending on the election. We're interested in seeing if that has any relationship to uh, the number of anti-discrimination laws in a given state. Um, so, you know, we're just going to start up with setting the model. Um, in this case, we're going to be saying that the Democrat, um, if a state is like Democratic, we're going to say, uh, put that as our baseline or reference level. So now our intercept term actually has some meaning, right? Because in a lot of, you know, multiple linear regression models, the uh, baseline uh, beta zero doesn't really have any like semantic meaning. It's just there, um, you know, to properly fit the regression. Um, so in this case, uh, XI2 is just going to be uh, representing GOP candidates, uh, sorry, GOP states, and then XI3 is uh, just going to be representing um, swing states. So pretty easy. Uh, we're just going to set up our regression model. 
as usual right here, right? Like we've seen this in the, like the previous chapter. So nothing's really changing. Uh, we're putting uh, one, one prior, like we're putting on is we think that, you know, based on uh, urban population and like historical bat voting patterns of a state, we're gonna say that maybe it's around like seven laws. It's not particularly that strong of a prior. And we're also going to let uh, Stan uh, choose priors for the uh, other uh, parameters in our model. Um, so, you know, follows, you know, pretty much the same format, right? Obviously, we're going to get to this, why we should not be using a normal model it should be pretty <laughs> obvious based on that graph. But let's just, you know, let's say we didn't look at that. We're just like, ah, it's going to be a normal model. Let, let's just go with that. And, uh, you know, we, we do it uh, here. Also, I guess, that one state is California, which makes sense if you know anything about American politics, that totally makes sense that California um, would have a high uh, number of anti-discrimination laws um, as a state. And again, right, you expect, again, right, so like I, I was a poli-sci major at, in undergrad, so I, I, I know a bit of this, um, although obviously I don't do politics now. <laughs> um, yeah, like Democratic states, right? You expect them to have like more anti-discrimination laws. Republican states, you you expect them not to have that. Um, although I guess you do see like maybe some instances where the uh, urban percentage as that increases, like maybe you know some more law, uh, laws for at least when it comes to GOP states. And then swing states are like, you know, kind of kind of a relationship there, but yeah, not really. I would say. Um, but again, kind of fits our intuition about uh, anti-discrimination laws, you know, looking at swing, democratic, and republican states. Uh, so we're just going to fit our, you know, our GLM, our little stand GLM uh, with our stand arm. And uh, we're going to do a posterior predictive check to see, like, is our model, our assumptions actually properly, um, whatchamacallit, uh, like retrofitting the data, right? Does our, does our model, you know, kind of more or less uh, capture the shape of the data. And um, uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> we can kind of clearly see right in this graph. Um, right. Does anyone, so it's like, what are the problems with this model kind of uh, that the graph is showing, our posterior predictive check? Does anyone want to venture? Can you scroll up a little bit? I, I um, Oh, sure. Like, well, no, sorry, like, oh. so I can see the graph. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the. We're getting some negative numbers in number of laws and yep, <laughs> that's a big one. Yeah, um, that's probably like the biggest one, right? Like conceptually, yeah. there is no such thing as having negative anti-discrimination laws, and that's right. The problem is that we're assuming that uh, our target, in this case, the number of anti-discrimination laws uh, in a state, uh, is normally distributed. But the problem with the normal distribution is that its support or the values on the x-axis, right, range from negative infinity. To in positive infinity. So mm -hmm. we also kind of saw this right in the in the distribution, right? It's like heavily mm. right skewed, doesn't really make any sense. Um, so obviously, yeah, thank thank you, uh, Ama, for saying that. You know, there's some negative values. Also, if we imagine that, uh, right, this in the dark blue, this is our uh, the distribution of the data. If let's say you were to like overlay our predictions on uh, the same, you know, uh, subplot. You could also see, right, like none of these really capture the structure of the data. Um, I, I guess I maybe would have preferred like a density plot, right, just to like show that. I think it would make yeah. it a bit more clear. Um, but like, you know, in these simulated, what, five data sets, we can clearly see that our model is not capturing the structure of, uh, of our target of interest, in this case, again, the number of anti-discrimination laws in the state. Um, so we can't really use a normal. But we can use uh, the Poisson or the negative binomial uh, models. The first one we're going to be talking about is the Poisson regression. Um, and Poisson uh, models are really good at modeling uh, count-related data. Um, so it's going to scroll down here. And we're just going to say that uh, the rate right, uh, of anti-discrimination anti laws in each state, we can model this with lambda, which is the one and only parameter in a Poisson distribution. Um, we're going to say that, uh, you know, that parameter lambda follows a Poisson uh, great. And we're going to then say that it can be modeled as a linear combination of um, you know, our intercept and our uh, three predictor variables, which um, measure, again, the level of uh, urban 
the per urban percentage in a given state and whether or not the state is um, a democratic state, a swing state, or a Republican state. Uh, before I go on, uh, well, I guess actually <laughs> it kind of cuts it off. Um, this model is still wrong because we're still predicting negative values. Mm. Um, so that's a problem. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're on the right track. So all we have to do is um, essentially just take the logarithm, right, of, uh, of lambda. That way, since a logarithm is defined from all, po uh, all positive values on the real line, we just have to take the logarithm of that. And then, you know, good, we now have a good linear relationship. Um, one thing, though, is that interpreting things on like the log scale, like log two laws or like log three, like urban percentage that makes it's really hard, right, to kind of conceptualize, like, especially if you were, you know, going to like present this to someone who maybe doesn't have like a statistical background, you don't really want to be talking about logarithms, right? Uh, so to get it on a more interpretable scale, we simply just exponentiate that, right, with, uh, you know, E or EXP, EXP, yeah, um, you know, it's that, you know, you just take, you just exponentiate it, right? And then we get it on a, um, it's a nonlinear scale, right? But we actually get something that's like way more interpretable. Um, in this case, though, our coefficients uh, do take on a different meaning. So, right, in like past, past units, especially like multiple linear regression, it would be something like, right, I mean, what's the thing that's taught in like every class? It's like, the you know for every one unit increase in like beta one there is like y units you know there's x units increase in y holding all predictors uh, constant right um that it's sort of similar but this take but with, now that we exponentiate our coefficients we're now talking about it uh as the multiplicative or percentage difference um so you know that this is just uh these two are equivalent right we're just taking a logarithm of lambda uh, in order to actually um, you know, mo model this relationship, right? And then exponentiating it is just getting it back on an interpretable scale. Um, so I, I like how this part of the book does it where we actually like, you know, go through each coefficient. So I'll just pick one. Um, so for instance, yeah, let's do this. Um, so this beta one measures the urban, is the urban percentage coefficient, right? Then, you know, percentage of urban people living in a, in a state. Um, so we have a beta one of 0 0.03. And when we, uh, that's again on the log scale, right? Um, so that's like not as interpretable. We just have to exponentiate that term and we then get a value of 1.03. Uh, now, what does that mean? Well, in this case, this means that um, for every one point, uh, one percentage point uh, increase in a state's urban population, um, we'd expect it to have uh, 1.03 times the number of anti-discrimination laws, or if you want to put it in terms of percentages, 3%. Makes, you know, way more interpretable than talking about logs and all of that. And, um, right, that, that, that's the same interpretation, right, we'd apply to the rest of the coefficients in the regression model. Um, one key point, and this is, uh, I think probably like the biggest assumption I would say with a Poisson is that um, the, the, the parameter you, for, of lambda, right? It, uh, when you take like the expectation of that, uh, it's equal to also to the variance. So that's like a pretty big assumption that the mean and the variance in the Poisson model have to be roughly equivalent. Uh, so in terms of regression, what that means is that as, let's say, the uh, mean increases, the variability in Y should also be, um, you know, increasing as well at roughly, again, like the same rate. Uh, a really good graphic I, I loved was just like kind of showing this in action. On the left, right, we see this is the good Poisson regression model, right? Um, we can see that as X increases, um, you know, the, the variation and, and mean do tend to increase as well um, at what seems to be right a fairly constant rate. And on the right, it looks like a good fitting model, um, but the problem is is that it, this violates one of the, the main assumptions in a uh, Poisson distribution is that again the mean and the variance are uh, equivalent. Um, so we can kind of see that right. It's all like clumped together, and it doesn't 
necessarily. This, this, this is the hard thing for like most social scientists because like that one on the left is like that's that is the evil of which we have been trained against all our <laughs> lives, right? Like this idea of heterogeneity as you you change uh, the x scale, right? And so yeah. it's, it's it's funny that is definitely a a trick to like just con you know conceptually wrap your head around it just because it's so antithetical to like our you know reality yeah. typical reality but you yeah because i think also like right because that's like obviously a big thing with just like regular least squares right it's that like the variance has to be like that like constant mm -hmm. and whatnot and it's like there are obviously other types of assumptions you can be making right right we think mm -hmm. it follows a plus on and here's why we think it follows a plus on mm -hmm. um, but i agree like i feel like so much of like the literature are just like books you read or like classes always about like here's the normal and normal is mm -hmm. great obviously a great distribution it's pretty cool but mm -hmm. like there are others mm -hmm. that can like model mm -hmm. other interesting phenomena you shouldn't just necessarily be constrained by that one distribution um any questions so far comments anyone cool i'm gonna keep chugging along but obviously feel free to interrupt me if i you know you want to add something or yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, like what we did above, we're just going to specify our priors. Um, the one thing um, for the centered intercept, uh, we're, we're saying that uh, the number of laws in like a typical state, you know, is we're going to say it ranges around seven. Uh, but since, again, we're putting us on the log scale, we have to just say like, you know, it's about two. So that's why like you see a two um, over here, right? That's just a very simple mapping. Um, like. So that's why you know we don't see seven. Because I, I was reading this, I'm like, wait, why is there not seven? And then I was like, oh, okay, cool. I, I just was not reading. Um, that's why. Um, and we're also um, we're not also like supplying that informative priors, right? Um, again, you know, my background in like just getting a poli sci degree, like this kind of makes sense too. That um, again, we're interested in looking at like urban percentage levels and whether or not a state is democratic or Republican or a swing state and how that impacts like anti-discrimination laws. Um, probably urban percentage is not going to be like, it probably is associated. I mean, we, we do see that right in the chapter, but there's probably like other, um, you know, exogenous variables that we're not considering uh, in this model. So even if it is associated, there might be something that actually better explains that. Um, so that's why we're also like setting like pretty wide, uh, pretty, you know, weekly informative priors, right, in our regression model. Um, so I just, you know, kind of want to say that. And yeah, I mean, you know, we're just going to do the same thing we've been doing uh, throughout this entire book. Uh, so we've been talking about MCMC, we're going to do some sampling of our uh, coefficients uh, over here. And we just, you know, run this with stand GLM. The one thing we are going to do, though, is a prior predictive check. Again, this is... Um, What's great about these, I think I was talking about this last week or two weeks ago, um, is that prior is that you know we assume priors on uh, for all these parameters, and let's say you know you want to plot them and visualize them. Uh, your visual, what you're visualizing is on the parameter space. Um, now, obviously, we're getting into more complicated models, um, and now that they're all jointly associated with each other, that makes it a lot harder to see like what your choice of prior, even if it seems like reasonable on a plot, um, it makes it harder to see like, what is what are these choice of priors uh, mean for, uh, mean on the scale of my data, right? So on the outcome space. So prior to observing uh, data, we can, you know, construct a prior predictive check, which just shows like what our priors mean on the scale of the data. And um, mm -hmm. what we get this, a mess of lines, <laughs> a mess of, you know, many regression lines, um, which again, it reflects our general uncertainty, right? We're like, we're not really that sure if like an increased or decrease in uh, a state's urban population uh, leads to more or less anti-discrimination laws. So this is like, you know, <laughs> while it's a mess, is like a good, um, you know, a, a good representation, right, of our uncertainty. Uh, even like, I, I find this funny too, like, even like with some dem states, they're like some regression lines uh, that like actually as urban percentage increases, there actually is a decrease of laws, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you, you can kind of like see again, these, these mess of lines, it's not really the case. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but again, reflects our general uncertainty, um, which I think is fine. 
Uh, now we actually are going to do, uh, you know, we're going to simulate our posterior, we're going to do all the draws from all of our coefficients. Um, so going to do that there. I guess they didn't visualize this. We're going to do our, you know, our, sim our you know, trace plots, uh, look at the posteriors, calculate the autocorrelation function, make sure everything is like good from a uh, model convergence standpoint. And then we're going to do a uh, posterior predictive check, right? So now we've observed data. Um, we have we have our posteriors for each coefficient, so we want to see what those posteriors mean, uh, those coefficients mean on now the outcome space, right? The data space. Uh, now that we've observed data, and we can simulate, you know, some data sets uh, over here with a histogram. Uh, I tend to find these not as like as useful, although like we can clearly see, yay, like that actually captures that right skewed nature that we did not <laughs> observe above, yeah. and also it's good. Um, we're plotting, um, I think it's what, 50? Yeah, so we're plotting like 50 uh, simulated data sets um, over here, which is indicated by these uh, light blue lines um, and why this is like our actual observed data, right? Like these 50 simulated data sets in like, my, how I think about it is like, it represents like 50 possible or plausible universes, right? Where like this <laughs> data could have uh, come from. And, you know, does a pretty good job. I mean, you can maybe, Maybe you want to quibble with like, there is maybe oh, some like, you know, uh, maybe this is a bit too high, but like it's it actually reasonably, you know, approximates the structure of our data way better, right? Than we again, what we started off with assuming mm -hmm. that uh, Y was distributed normally. Um, so great, you know, we did something, what, yeah, we actually made something that um, looks pretty good <laughs> and we could actually like defend. Um, all right, next bit is um you know interpreting the posterior so this is a good check we're like okay model looks good um now we can actually uh you know uh sample some of those uh simulated coefficients and then see what 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 it tells us um so this is just uh right 50 posterior plausible models relationship of the state's number of anti-discrimination laws with urban population rate and historical voting trends um would anyone oh, hey. like I just oh, sure. want to comment real quickly. I when I, I did go through this chapter in R, um, just working through these things, and I ran into the same problem that uh, Ryan mentioned about the uh oh, the draws being <laughs> and then I forgot about the end thing. So I'm like, what the heck? What did he say? Why does this work? <laughs> so oh, they just, somebody just changed think. the name of the function. That's uh yeah. pretty well, it's not just to change the function, the end is not n anymore. It's something and else draws. right yeah, it's and draws draw. i think well that's like sorry that's, draws. sorry it's yeah. not the, the, the it's not the function name that changes it's the arguments yeah that change and that's that's a common thing and so it was so frustrating because i i knew you told us what the answer was like oh, i can't remember yeah just, just a little error message is not helpful at all <laughs> <laughs> not only are we are we deprecating the ad fitted draws you should replace with this other function but hey n change too so just so you know you could put that in there right but no. yeah. this is the, this is the fundamental problem with open source i mean I'm, i think python probably does a better job of this than our but nah, yeah like, it's yeah, the same it's, kind of thing yeah, yeah i think it depends i've run into the same mm -hmm. kind of thing yeah sure. where i'm just like wait why is this broken <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be yeah we have to have some way of i mean i know we have docker and all that stuff but yeah we need yeah. some some better solution i think going forward you know, at some point i don't i don't know what it is but yeah um so, so yeah, what is it instead of ad fitted draws what is the new name of the function oh the oh. The function is the same name. It's, it's the same a, ad fitted draws. It's just that, okay, hold on. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So, so it's N, it's, it's N draws, isn't it? Isn't that what it is? Okay. But the function didn't change too. It changed to something else like add. <gasps> oh, that's, oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I right. forgot. I don't have my R open right now, but it did change. You could go. Yeah, you could go into the, if you go into the, um, yeah. Probably, yeah, extracting and visualizing. Let's see. It is no extracting draws. E draws or e pred, e pred or something like that, isn't e, it? Wait, you might be right. Yeah. E, e pred or whatever, what is that? Add e pred draws. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's what it is. And uh, I guess we just hop over to the function. It is n draws. So it's add e pred draws. draws and yeah. the argument is n draws. So you see it on the book. 
yeah that's here's, why. What's, <laughs> here, here's what's messed up is like okay when was this book published like was it isn't it just like it just recently, recently i think like yeah. this year <laughs> yeah. yeah and so there's the fact that it's like i mean i guess it's probably just happenstance that you know mm -hmm. yeah they just happen to you know but it's it's um yeah don't forget you write the book like you know a year or two before that this is early, yeah. you know so who knows oh, actually yeah no that's actually a good point too it yeah, probably all worked fine it still works <laughs> by the way it just gives it just gives a warning it still works it just yeah. gives a deprecation okay. warning at my company this is just all reason to just keep using spss so let's, <laughs> let's just be quiet let's, let's just be quiet about this because exactly. i don't i don't want to keep those people i don't want to give those people any yeah. hope i don't want to give those people any hope i don't want to give them any reason or fuel so for their for their myopic so you know yeah 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 it's uh yeah because of course you know if you're pushing a bunch of buttons you know that's that's uh you know that, that that's what i think of spss or you know any kind of like it's just yeah this, you know, pull this down click this it's like that feels mm -hmm. that, that feels safe you know <laughs> sorry that was that's i was true. being i was being sarcastic no no it's so <laughs> yeah. true push a button get an answer nobody you probably wouldn't even notice that problem with the poisson uh the non-normal distribution because you just push the button get the answer out right yeah. well yeah hey, I, actually, I pushed the button why did it work <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I guarantee you there's probably like a ton of published papers that you could do like a meta-analysis on or like some kind of like text analysis where you actually look at how many people mention SPSS in their method section yeah. and then they, they have a potential outcome that could be considered a count outcome and they still mm -hmm. did some kind of I guarantee I mean no, I shouldn't say guarantee I strongly suspect a strong prior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A strong prior on this <laughs> yeah I have yeah, a strong strong prior. Prior. yeah 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 that's funny so well there you go there's a nice little Bayesian analysis you can do yeah yeah <laughs> You have yeah, a very yeah. strong prior hole. SPSS, <laughs> SPSS users are not thinking about Poisson models. That's that's my hypothesis. <laughs> Probably. Come at me. That's all I'm saying. If you, if you think otherwise. Anyway. Great. Um, okay. So, oh, yeah. So going back to this. Um, what, well, I guess, you know, looking at this graph, right, this is where, again, adding some fitted draws, or I guess ePred draws, right, with tidy days. Um, you know, 50 regression uh, lines. What do you, what would you guys like say that this plot like shows us? If I, I can also zoom in a little bit too. <laughs> um, well, obviously there's more uh, laws in, in, um, in them. We have this like the nice little straight gap of lines uh, between the, the three, the three groups. And then obviously as, It'd be, it, 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 as there's an inter, it looks like there's maybe an interaction between percentage urban and uh, historical. Mm. Uh, so, so as urban percentage goes up, and especially for them Democrat, them states or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other? So is this contrasting with the first one where everything was all over the place? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, right. So yeah. obviously, like we had this, you know, we had a lot of uncertainty because, like, yeah, we don't really know, right? Um, but I also would say that, and, and right, and like, you know, we go scroll back up. It's like, okay, good fit to the data, right? So like, everything still looks good, even though we were very uncertain. Um, maybe this is like an argument where like the data, right, has more weight, right? Because we didn't, we let Stan choose like weekly informative priors, and we also didn't. The one prior we did choose wasn't like particularly that strong. Um, but I think also like what you're saying, Ryan, too, right? Like, yeah, Dem states, there's like a clear separation between each of the groups, right? Like Dem states tend to have more like yeah. anti-discrimination laws and the GOP is right at the bottom and the swing voter, swing states are right in the middle. Um, I wouldn't read too much into the separation because you built that in, right? They, they all have the same exponential slope as whatever you want to call that's it, That's right? true. And I guess what I was also going to say, too, is they well. They can't cross. They can't cross by any yeah. means, by the way, the model is that's 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 a fair point um i guess what that i was also going to say that required interaction term yeah mm -hmm. i guess some um, what i was also going to say is that these slopes aren't like particularly big too right even for like every group right i think they're they're not like huge which kind of again i, I think like makes sense too from like even if a state has again more like or a larger urban population doesn't necessarily mean again um that they will have higher 
uh, anti you know, larger anti discrimination laws, right? Um, you can think of like some examples where even like in a really dem state, which actually we'll get to uh, right now with Minnesota, um, where there could be like possible other reasons, right, that could explain like why a state doesn't have um, a ton of anti discrimination laws that isn't related to um, the urban population of the states. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know that, that's our posterior model. Um, Again, we're just you know calculating the credible interval, right? An uh, eighty percent credible interval um, for each of our coefficients, and the estimates here represent the median estimate, right? For each coefficient, um, so you know taking uh, you know like percent urban, right? This is on again the log scale. We just exponentiate that, and um, we'd expect you know a uh, a state with one percent uh, one percent increase in urban population to have one point six five uh, percent more uh, anti discrimination laws. Um, remember, that's also like the median too, right? So like there's still a, a whole other universe, right, in that posterior that we're not necessarily capturing, but it has that's you know the interpretation of those coefficients. Um, so let's do. I, I like the quizzes too. Um, yeah. So the posterior median. Oh, could I just interrupt? Oh. I want to make one quick observation. If you, if you didn't notice this, notice that the uh, uh, that the percent urban on log scale is 0 0.016, right? Mm. And yep. then in terms of percentage, it's it's uh, one point six percent. Say, oh look, I didn't need to take a log, and it's an in interesting. I don't need to take an exponential, and that's an interesting thing you can use when the numbers are small like that. It turns out e to the x is approximately equal to one plus x for small x. Hmm. So when you have small rates like that, you can just read the percentage right off, at least approximately. Oh, um, you can see it right yeah. down here. It says where it says e to the point oh one six four goes yeah. to point oh one six five. Like, wait a minute, that's not a coincidence. That's just the way logarithm oh. exponentials work. <laughs> oh, that's actually neat. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I actually like that. <laughs> Saves yourself some work. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the quiz, um, so right, our posterior median of beta three, we're saying it's roughly negative uh, 0 0.61 on the log scale. Uh, we exponentiate that, we get 0.54. Um, so how can we interpret this value when holding constant uh, percent urban? Hmm. B, right? Any other guesses? Can you scroll up a little bit so you're on the quiz? Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. other way, yeah, sorry. So the anti, oh, up, sorry. Oh, I, sorry, my bad. <laughs> uh, number of, oh, I see, are you trying to like not have us that have yeah, this stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I also have an oh. ultra wide monitor. It's like annoying, but that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's. Steering meeting of B and three is, uh, how do we interpret this value when holding constant? Ugh. Actually, when I read this, I actually did look at this, but it was like bef before the weekend. So now I'm like completely, <laughs> completely you, forgotten. You erased it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Number of anti. Okay. So wait a minute. So the number. Um... Oh, it's got to be A, yes. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Sorry. Um... Uh, I'm not really sure why, but I guess um, we are using them as our baseline, and then we multiply the 0 0.54 times 100, then we get 54. So I'm thinking B, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah, so it would be, yeah, it is B, so it is B. Um, oh. The reason, and the book explains this, is that um, the one thing we have to remember is that our intercept term, this is representing, uh, right, Democrats. So it has to be, when we're interpreting the other beta coefficients, it has to be in relation to that. So what this is saying, right, is that swing states tend to have, you know, 54% oh, as many, exactly, the relative, right. 54% um, yeah. as many anti-discrimination laws as dem-leading states. 
Uh, for what it's worth, I when I first went through this, I said A um, yeah. because I was like, oh, negative. Yeah, it's that. But like when you think of it as B, that makes like more sense, right? Because it's still like swing states have less laws than Democrats. Um, but yeah, like I, I had initially said like, oh, you, you expect a decrease, but that's like subtly different, right? Than what B is saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know. Wait, you know. okay, so. Oh, sure. Uh, it's saying that swing states have, can you go back to the answer? Oh, yeah. Um, so 54% is still less because they will have like 100% and then they will have 54% of that. So, so sorry, still, say that again. So still meaning that swing states have less anti the discrimination yeah. laws. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, but it's not like, but it's not like the, it's like it's a decrease, right? I mean, it sort of is, right? Subtly, it's like they just have less, but it's not like the coefficient doesn't mean, right, that it's like there's a decrease um, for every extra swing state, right? You, you'd expect that. Um, it's just that they have just less compared to a dem state. Um, that's, you know, that, again, I thought it was, I was wrong when I first went through this. Mm. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna do some uh, posterior prediction. Uh, the book talks about an interesting case of Minnesota. Minnesota, if you know anything, very dumb state. Um, had pretty much votes. Actually, it was a, what, what election? It was it 2016 they actually vote for Trump? They might have. Mm, yeah. But so. historically, historically, a very dumb state. Um, so yeah, 73% of their residents reside in urban areas. That's a lot. Uh, but they have four anti-discrimination laws. Okay, so what, so what does that mean, right? So we're gonna like simulate some predictions right from our posterior, um, do all of that. So right now we're thinking, oh, it could range from like 10 to 30, right? Because we think that, you know, higher urban percentage likely correlates with number of anti-discrimination laws in a state. Um, and we look at it and uh, that black line <laughs> represents um, the number of laws that are actually in, um, in a number of anti-discrimination laws that are actually in Minnesota. Um, and this is where we, we were predicting and clearly our predictions are way off, at least for Minnesota, right? Uh, we, didn't, we, we didn't look at the other states. Um, you can obviously also do this like manually too, right? This is just a, uh, and, you know, you could just make the histogram of the predictions. You can also do it manually like this, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, leads to the same result. But I guess like one thing they don't necessarily talk about like a ton a ton is that like, does this indicate that our model's wrong? I mean, like it could, right? Like maybe um, maybe there is like some large problem, right? In the model, um, but that could maybe be solved with like, I would say including more predictors, right? Like probably urban percentage, even if it does correlate with like the number of anti-discrimination laws probably isn't like a large influence, right? There's like probably other things um, like you could even think, and actually they do mention, I think a good uh, thing over here, like the number of laws don't, uh, doesn't actually measure the quality of the laws, right? So even let's say, I don't really know a ton about Minnesota's like politics, right? In terms of like the quality of these laws, but let's say these four laws do a really good job at preventing anti-discrimination, right? And that, that could be totally plausible. So even if they don't have a lot of them, the quality of those laws could be very good. So too, like, let's say you have a state like California, right? Has like 155 of them. Um, maybe half of them don't really do anything, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but that's, I think, a good thing too, right? Um, to remember that even though this prediction is like, you know, off, maybe that means something, but like, you know, probably just want to add in more uh, stuff. Into... Yeah, you're right. Though. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. Uh, That's also true, right? Minnesota, <laughs> yeah. Minnesota may be more efficient in their anti-discrimination laws. Yeah. Right? So counting laws is not that great of a metric. So yeah. Yeah. And also I saw what you said, Ron, in the chat. Um, I agree. Like, you know, there's the famous say, saying by, I think it's like George Box or George Cox. All models are wrong. Some are useful, mm. right? Like every George model we're going to, oh, sorry. George Box is the, yeah, he said Thank that. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Right. And that, that's like, I think also kind of like, in a way comforting too. It's like, you're not making, you know, there's never gonna make like one true model, right? Like, mm -hmm. like totally understand everything. Um, we could just make 
more and more useful approximations to like understanding some phenomena of interest. Um, but um, the, our data, isn't our data basically using 50 states? So like 50 states is quite small too, right? Well, yeah, we should use like 200 states. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're, yeah, we should have used like GANs and just generate more states. And yeah. Yeah. We should. Okay. We should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should. Yeah. Um, I, I guess like what, what I do know in like the po like poli sci, um, political science, right? You actually are bringing up a good point. It's like we don't have a ton of data, which is why we also, which is also why like Bayesian inference really makes sense in a lot of these things because we have strong priors. Uh, we have like understanding of like, you know, this isn't really talking about voting patterns, right? Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of doing as a proxy. Um, but yeah, like we don't have a ton of data. We only have 50 states. We only have like this many elections, right? In a given year. Um, so that's why also I think it, another thing too is like why you would have, you know, why Bayesian inference especially applies I think here is because we can, model in uh you know stronger priors right in a, in a in this case right we we don't have a ton of data um so that's also like i think another reason why um we have these priors yeah if that hopefully answered your question <laughs> your comments <laughs> yeah. um okay yeah then i was just simulation and again like right we get into like the model evaluation stuff um I like, you know, how fair is the model? Probably not biased in data collection. Like, probably not. We're just collecting this from an equality index, which I forget the group that was doing it at the beginning. But you're like, probably not like introducing like bias. Although, one thing I do like that they do bring is that state, you should not confuse state level trends for, for uh, voting behavior. So, even if let's say, a, you know, like, oh, we think urban percentage, uh, urban population, right? We, we expected to see a more increased anti-discrimination laws, maybe, right? Even if like you're in a democratic state, like maybe that's the case, but that also doesn't get to like how individuals vote in like the state level, the district level, county level, right? That you're gonna need like to really, uh, you know, tune your analysis to like a more smaller level, right? Than just like, the whole state. Um, so I think that's also a good thing too to bring up. Um, obviously, we didn't plot any of the uh, other 49 states to see if maybe there are some issues with our predictions on a state level. Um, but again, probably you would just in like reality, you would definitely be including a lot more predictors of if this is like something that you think is, um, you know, related. Also, you'd probably have like a set of stronger priors. Um, I also like this too, is that I found this interesting. Um, we do a pretty good job at like predicting um, the number of anti-discrimination laws for uh, the GOP, right? Like these intervals, uh, if I blow this up a little bit, uh, pretty small. Uh, swing in, for swing in democratic states, it's a bit more wide, um, which I think kind of makes sense if you know, you know anything about, again, know anything about American politics, uh, you'd probably expect GOP states to more or less not pass anti-discrimination laws. Um, it's not really a big thing in, in the party's like platform. And Democrats, right, they talk obviously a lot more about it um, in terms of their platform, but that can also, you know, how that thing gets bored out, bored, how that bears out in on a state level, right? You can have, there's some variation too. Um, again, like they're even like some like, Places that are like a dem state, but maybe they're a bit more like purple looking. Like Pennsylvania is a good example of this, where um, like there's currently uh, a Democratic governor, but there is uh, a Republican senator and a Democratic senator right now in office, and there's an election right, right now happening, uh, like you know, in Pennsylvania for at the Senate level. So I think that's also again kind of makes more sense why we'd probably be predicting better for GOP states than swing states and Democratic states. Um, and then this is really just like some metrics, right, that we just want to like calculate to see if our predictions make any sense um, and they're not too, too off. And uh, this is just uh, cross validation, you know, and all of that. Oh, yep, Mama. Uh, I can't, I think you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, there's a sentence up there which says um, we got 22%. Uh, um, 
Oh, this okay. Yeah. 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 So that, again, like that also depends, right? Like is, um, going back to what I was saying, right? It's like, is that bad? Maybe, right? Like it, it all depends mm -hmm. on like, I think with all of these things, it's like, um, it depends, like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> It's a, like that could be indicated in the, that could mean that like the model is bad and that something needs to be fixed. It could also mean that like hmm. maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. It really depends mm -hmm. on like the goal of your analysis, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, how, I would say again, you would get... incorporate more stuff into it, but yeah. How did we get that number? The um, 22, 11. Yeah, good question. Countering with, with negative deep zero. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is just, um, so it's actually in this sentence, uh, countering okay. is positive with a negative, the observed number of, of laws um, for only yeah. within the 95 percent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it means so like our place. predictions are falling. Actually, I think another way of looking at it is here, right? It's actually in this plot um, for the prediction intervals. Um, right, these are our predictions, but you see like some of them fall outside of that 95 percent. Um, mm -hmm. So that could also, you know, maybe maybe you want to like look into that. Depends on again, like why you're doing this analysis. Maybe you want to incorporate more. I, you know, I would just say you should incorporate like more predictors, right? That you think relate to this phenomenon of interest, because probably or again, I've been saying this a bunch, but like urban percentage is probably not like that associated <laughs> with the number of anti-discrimination laws. Um, maybe you want to find like a more you know important variable. Uh, and that. So that's also why you get that um, that 22%. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I know we don't have a ton of time, but I'm gonna try to speed through the negative binomial regression. I love, love the discussion um, so far with the Poisson. Uh, so this point we're gonna be looking at a different data set. This is, uh, I actually remember this. Um, <laughs> when the Cards Against Humanity, they sent out uh, monthly surveys to get the pulse of the nation. I, I, I just, I didn't find that I, I just forgot this. Um, but um, they wanted to, um, they, you know, for, for this beat in the book, we want to model the number of books uh, somebody has read in the past year uh, by two predictors of interest, uh, the respondent's age, and uh, the and their answer to the question of whether they'd rather be wise but unhappy or happy but unwise. Um, kind of seems like a so. I don't know. <laughs> it seems like a, 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 almost like a Faustian uh, a bargain in, in a way. Um, we're just going to be filtering just to um, anyone that has read fewer than 100 books. And we're going to you know, do some exploratory data analysis. We clearly see here that books is heavily right skewed. Um, OK, probably should use a plus on, right? Definitely not the normal. We knew, we knew what happened at the beginning of the chapter when we used the normal model, just bad things for the model. Um, <laughs> and like, you maybe a relationship between like age and books, but like, I, that just is a lot of points, right? So like, maybe there's a relationship at best very weak, but I don't really know if anyone can derive much out of this, just like cloud of points. And then we want to look at a box plot of, uh, for, of happy but unwise and wise but unhappy uh, in terms of like the number of books they've read. And it would seem that the wise but unhappy you know, maybe reads a little bit more books on average, but it's like pretty small. So mm -hmm. I don't, you know, maybe these aren't the most informative plots. Um, so like, we don't really know, maybe, right? Um, but, you know, we see the skewed count structure. So we're thinking, yes, Poisson regression, let's do it. Um, we're going to use like kind of the same priors we did above. We're going to let Stan uh, choose some of the priors that we, you know, choose the priors that we did not, you know, specify. Great. And uh, we're going to do a prior predictive check and everything has gone wrong. <laughs> um, hmm. This is quite bad, right? Like we're not even capturing the structure of this data. And you might think, well, why? It's a, it's a, it's clearly right skewed. Plus on should be doing this. Um, hmm. And this gets back to that one really large assumption in the Poisson model is that the variance and mean are roughly equivalent with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Can this you scroll case, up a little bit? Sorry. You're, oh, um, oh, sure. Yeah, my yeah. bad. 
Um, right, again, like these are, again, the light blue, right, represents like simulated data sets, right? And mm -hmm. uh, they, not good, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. doesn't at all capture the structure. Actually looks kind of like a norm, like it's a unimodal, kind of looks a little bit like normal, quite bad. Um, and this gets to uh, the fact that um, we're going to talk about over dispersion. I would be lying to say if I intuitively understand it. Um, but um, this is an example of a Y variable, account variable that is over dispersed. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what we should have done right before we're just like throw a model at this, at our data, is maybe look at the mean variance and readership across all subjects. And uh, okay, so we have our survey data and all right, so on average, people read 10.9 books. Okay, it doesn't seem like insane, but the variance is quite big. It's 198. That's a, that's a lot, <laughs> right? Like that's a ton. So that clearly grossly violates the assumptions mm. of, the, uh, of the Poisson model. Um, they also look at this at uh, different age brackets too. So um, for example, people who are like, you know, 18 to 45, um, happy but unwise, right? It means this, but the variance is huge. And we kind of see that same pattern happen for every group. Um, so what do we do? Uh, well, we're going to say that our, our book readership, right, it's over dispersed. Um, to me, I, I, I kind of like this definition. I was like, you know, read it verbatim. It's like a random variable Y is over dispersed. If the observed variability in Y exceeds the variability expected by the assumed probability model of Y, I guess like, yeah, I guess what, what the Poisson assumes that variance and mean are equal. In this case, we, case we can clearly see that is not the case. Um, variance is way bigger than the average. Um, so I guess it just really means that if we assume some sort of model and like, the, you know, I guess has like a variance component that is like grossly violated, we have to like do something to the model. In this case, we can either add a, uh, an over dispersion term um, to the Poisson model, or if you use the negative binomial model, um, that is the same type of deal. Like it's you know used with count related data, but this case in this case uh, it does not have that assumption of uh, equal mean and variance uh, that the Poisson model has. In this case, we're using the negative binomial. Um, I guess I don't really know. I guess right that just be like adding another term, right? Just Poisson, like mm -hmm. probably just like a plus, and then. Here's my dispersion term, right. um, but we're going to be using the negative binomial. Um, so that's how we're going to be modeling this. Uh, all of that stuff is here. Um, now, I guess setting this term, I'm going to be honest, again, was it really getting it? I guess like you have this massive, so this is a, you know, a Poisson with just a rate of five, and then they have the same mean. I guess like when you have a really large over dispersion term, like it just kind of drops like the Y and like the probability mass function. Whereas if you have a lower one, it kind of like slowly decreases. Mm. This may be my intuition. I could also be very wrong. That's kind of just what I'm basing it off I, of two graphs. I found it helpful to look at that equation above where it says the variance is equal to mu plus mu squared over R. So oh, yeah. if R is very, very big, the variance is, this, is equal to the, the, the mean, in which case it's Poisson again, which you can see, right? So negative binomial oh. 5, 10,000 is a similar or exactly the same probably as Poisson 5. But when R is small, then the variance gets bigger, right? That makes and sense. That's, yeah. So that's, that's basically the control there for what R does. Actually, yeah, that's good. Yeah, because yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I got to jump off in a minute. Um, are we gonna hey ryan before yeah. You yeah before you jump off i just want to uh, looking at the schedule real quick uh are you able to take on the the uh bay uh naive bays thing on the 5th of october because i have a medical thing I, it's probably my turn but i can do the next thing the hierarchical goal if you're the next thing that. is logistic i think no um, no i know logistics that, i'm saying oh, i'll do naive that's, bays that's fine yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm talking yeah. two weeks ahead just trying to get get ahead of it Almost got next week. We got that covered. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um. So yeah, are we. I don't know if we're gonna. Are we. Are we gonna. I mean, are you guys gonna try to finish this. How much more is there for this? Oh, not not a lot. Yeah. It's we'll really just done. this. So we'll uh, get yeah. Done. I'll. If I, so I'll probably have to jump off. Of the, if, um. I'll do it quietly, but I'll see. I'll see. <laughs> I'll see you all next week at the. Okay. Uh, obviously. Good deal. See you.
See you guys. Yeah. Bye. 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 Um, I was going to say, Ron, I can always count on you to, uh, you know, illuminate the math because sometimes I'm just like, ah, and then, but it's like, oh, you look at it again and like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, you let that get bigger. And yeah, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we're just going to do a negative binomial regression, kind of the same priors uh, that we've been using before. It's all over here. Um, I guess the only new thing, right, is we're assuming that um, our, our dispersion term uh, falls in exponential. Why? Uh, well, the dispersion term can only be defined on the positive real line. So that's why we're going to say it follows an exponential distribution because the exponential, the exponential distribution is also, you know, from zero to, you know, positive infinity. So that's why, you know, we're doing it here. But obviously, like, there are other um, positive right skewed distributions that one could use. Exponential is just an easy one. Um, and yeah, we're going to regress age and uh, wise on wise onto books. And you are, you know, going to sample again that we've been doing throughout uh, the book. And we're going to do a pot. I guess we didn't do a prior predictive check, uh, but we're going to do a posterior predictive check. And yay, right? Like that, that's a good graph, right? This, this graph inspires joy. Um, <laughs> not, not what we saw again uh -huh. before. Um, so yay, like, you know, the, the, again, the light blue lines, right, are, are simulated data sets. And it follows the data pretty well. So great, we're happy. We can, uh, you know, then we can actually in interpret these coefficients. Um, so one thing is, uh, where is it? Yeah, Kirsten's prioritization of wisdom versus happiness. So there's no significant association between age and book readership. Uh, why? Well, if we look to age, zeros in that interval, right? So like, we're pretty sure that, uh, that it, there is no association, right? Because there's the zero, which means like no effect. So, you know, we're, we're pretty confident that this doesn't have um, any, um, any relationship to like the number of books someone reads. reads. Um, and, then for here, right, so when controlling for a person's age, um, people that prefer wisdom over happiness tend to read more than those who prefer happiness over wisdom. Um, so, you know, let's say we assume that they are the same age. Um, we'd expect, you know, a person that prefers wisdom to read 1.3 times as many or 30% uh, more books as somebody that um, prefers happiness. Um, which actually kind of sounds big, but actually, I guess not. I mean, 1.3 times as many. So it's not actually like a huge effect, which I guess is also bore out by uh, the box plot we saw above. Um, so yeah. And you know. also the number we're using, because it's like the mean was like between nine and 12. So yeah. if you're doing nine times 1.3, still not that very much different. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, there's like, there's an association, but like the effect isn't like huge, which, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense. I feel like if you just like to read books, you just like to read books. Right. And like, yeah, maybe people who want wisdom more than happiness will maybe read more, but yeah, it's not, you know, it's not a huge effect. Um, and all of this, right. is just about GLM models, generalized linear models. Um, that's like kind of where we can put all the models you learned so far. So like, you know, beta binomial, well, just binomial, gamma, normal, all of those uh, can just be uh, housed in the bigger family, bigger tree of generalized linear models. Um, really what I took away, at least from this is just like, um, yeah, I mean, you could just, you know, you, you look at the data, you can just kind of like fit the regression that you want, right? Because they're all the same type of thing, just, you know, you switch out your likelihood function depending on uh, your assumptions about how your data is distributed. Um, that's really the only thing. Also, I guess the log link function, I guess you have to decide a bit more about that. I think that's maybe in the logistic regression section that they like make more of a point of this, because I know this transforms like the space of your data. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really it. Um, you know, chapter summary. Um, I guess we don't really have time for exercises, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, that was, that was the chapter. Um, hopefully that was helpful to some of you.
<laughs> um, and yeah, I will also be out October 5th, uh, just so. And also I think the week after too, because I'm going to a conference, but maybe. I'll, I'll be here October 5th. I just have, I just won't have any time that week. Yeah. To, uh, prepare, I don't think so. Or actually, I guess, because when do I go? I go to, I'm going to Louisiana for a conference. Um, I just want to see, October 5th. Oh no, I'll actually be able to come for the 12th. Um, but I almost got next Sunday. week, right? Yeah. The uh, logistic regression. Regression, yep. yeah. And then, mm -hmm. um, then Ryan has naive phase. Then we get to hierarchical models. So that actually be fun. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Good well, job. Yeah. So uh, again, as usual, uh, no one really takes me up on this. But if you do some of the exercises <laughs> and you have questions, feel free to so, post on Slack. So which one did you do then? I'll go try the one you did. I did the uh, eagles. Uh, there's like a set of three or four exercises yeah. about eagles count. So Yeah. The first time I'm reading this, because it's all new to me, I'm reading more for, okay, do I understand what is going on intuition before I even get into like the arrow side of it? Yeah. So yeah. I do the yeah. same thing. I feel like that's the, I, that, that's how it works in my brain where I'm like, okay, I cannot like, I'll look at the code after. Well, okay. I read it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I did, I, again, I did it with Python. Um, and one thing I really spent a lot of time with is I used Py. I did it with B Bambi, worked like a charm. Um, you don't have all the diagnostic tools that R does though, like that nice predictive thing. Um, you can do that predict PP check, but you can't do the, um, those, that nice linear plot with the air bars on it, whatever that was. That's so cool. That one's not so easy to get out of uh, Bambi you? and IMC. There's something like it called plot LM in ArcBiz, but it's not as yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, oh, it isn't. I haven't, yeah, I, I really haven't think. done it for regression. Yeah. Um, so I was but, like, I'm like, oh, I like the prior predictive plots. Yeah. yeah the prior predictive plot's say. good. Yeah. Um, that stuff's good. But uh, the other thing was um, I ran into, I did for the fun of it, instead of using Bambi, I built my own, you know, with IMC, the higher, uh, the, not the higher, but the, uh, the, the, negative binomial Thank model just to make sure i understood it because it was like so hard to like there's so much going on there i said let me just build it up myself i'll put in all the priors and put the likelihood and everything else in and my monte carlo thing just would never like it ran forever it was super slow <laughs> bambi ran in like 36 seconds and mine took like 20 minutes and then mostly didn't it had a bunch of divergences and stuff so what was the problem it turns out that's what i want to share with you Centering your data is so important in these oh, things because, yeah. because of the link function that exponential blows up if you just like blindly like oh, I did just shove everything in there. Yeah. You're taking a log of 2000, you know, the year is a big number, right? So the sampler is so, like, no, yeah. <laughs> we are not doing this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it does it, but it's super slow. Yeah. It's like crunches so slowly, but then you like center and it's like, boop, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember this from like reading that Bayesian book in Python. Um, the guy that I think you, we talked about this book before, right? That Bayesian analysis and Python yeah. or whatever. He yeah. wrote another book before that, um, a packet book, which I did go through a long time ago. And I forgot that was like one of the key things he like hammered a couple different times in there, send your data, send your data. And I'm like, of course, I <laughs> immediately get bit by it. But just sharing that <laughs> wisdom with you that I learned the hard way a couple no, hours and like, banging my head against the wall, like trying to optimize the thing, all kinds of other weird ways, vectorizing and everything else. It turns out all I needed to do is center it and it would work fine. Mm. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, great. Well, I'll see you guys um, right now, next week. Next week. Yep. Next week. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, guys. Yeah. See you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.